Coming up on this episode, a look at another big report linking Clay Thompson to an Eastern Conference team ahead of free agency, plus a look to the Warriors offseason in their search for a second star. How far should that extend, and will it be worth it as the franchise looks to bounce back from a 10th place finish in the Western Conference this season? Yes, yes, welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast. Been a while between episodes, been a little bit busy. Uh, and then over the weekend, well, if you can hear that the audio isn't quite absolutely at its crisp level, it's probably because I don't have my external microphone with me. Uh, well, I do. It's actually just over there. However, uh, on the weekend, I was in Melbourne. I was just doing some work and I managed to just pour some water essentially all over my laptop, which cooked my laptop completely. It won't charge at all. Uh, and so that was just a, a nightmare of a situation. Had to go out on uh, on Sunday, hear my time, buy a new laptop because obviously I need it for work and whatever else. Uh, yeah, pretty much I was just sitting on a table and uh, had a, a glass of water in front of me. Had the glass held in my hand. There's a wine bottle also on the table. I've managed to somehow push that over. I thought it was going to hit the floor, so I tried to catch the wine bottle as it fell onto the floor. And of course, in the process, I've dropped the glass of water onto the laptop. So yeah, what a man. Uh, but it means the external microphone, because I've got a brand new laptop, uh, the external microphone won't actually fit into it uh, or, or sync with it at all. So uh, just going to have to run with this and I'm going to have to go and buy a microphone in the next few days. So we'll get it sorted, but hopefully this episode will be okay regardless. Uh, been a while, as I said, since I've talked Warriors basketball, not too much to write home about, I suppose this Time this season when we're still in playoff action uh, to start the second round of the playoffs. The the Knicks Pacers series starts here in about fifteen minutes. Uh, you know, there's not too much news floating about in terms of off season stuff with so many teams still competing, obviously, for the NBA championship. Uh, so from a Warriors standpoint, a little bit weird, a little bit different, obviously, to be out so early and to have this elongated off season, obviously, and have all this time for speculation. Uh, where it's really just speculation at this point. There's not too much uh, necessarily going on, uh, but of course there's going to be stuff going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to yet. And one of those, of course, uh, and the biggest one is Clay Thompson. And I thought it was a good time to do an episode today, given that we had the report from Sham Sharania of The Athletic reporting that uh, the Orlando Magic further interested in Clay Thompson. And not only that, but there's mutual interest between Clay and the Orlando Magic, which is a tough one for me, a tough pill for me to swallow because usually it would be easy for me, like in this situation where, you know, Clay's my favorite player of all time. Obviously, I'm a big Warriors fan, so I don't want him to leave under any circumstances, really. Uh, but it'd be really easy for me. It'd be really good, I think, for me if, you know, he was linked to another team that I just didn't like at all, say, you know, the Lakers or something like that, you know, a veteran team who are kind of competing with the Warriors in the Western Conference, yeah, who are a rival of sorts. It'd be really easy if that was the case. And then, you know, I could just basically say, no, Clay, don't do it. F you, Clay, whatever else. And be and get angry about it and get angry about it. And the issue here is that I can't get angry about this this report and the, and the you know number of reports that have linked him to the Magic because from all sides, I think it just... Makes sense. You saw the magic. They obviously went out to the Cavs uh, a couple of days ago. Or yesterday, in fact, it was still my time. Uh, yesterday morning, they went out to the Cleveland Cavaliers in Game 7. A really hard-fought series. A kind of what I would label as a pointless series. Those two were fighting it out to just lose to Boston in the, sec in the second round. Uh, you know, put all their eggs into trying to win that series, obviously. And neither team is going to be able to beat Boston. Uh, the Cavs certainly won't be able to. And I don't think the magic would have either. Uh, but I think it was a good series for the Magic. It was kind of the, the kind of one where they could get experience into Paolo and Franz uh, and really you know, show them the ropes, I suppose, and let them you know, learn through their mistakes in playoff action without really the, you know, they're not going to get criticised for you know, losing in the first round of the playoffs. I think all, all Magic fans should be pretty happy with how that series panned out and they've had a really positive season. Uh, and now, you know, they've got all this cap space to, to work with over the off season, which could include Clay. And, you know, according to that report from Shams, you know, $40 million could be the number, which is a, a, a price range that I don't think the Warriors are necessarily, you know, the Warriors aren't necessarily going to be willing to match. And I think it just makes sense on all sides. I think from a Magic standpoint, they clearly need more three-point shooting outside of, 
of Franz and Paolo, you know, they were so Paolo reliant, you know, particularly in that game seven. And, you know, when he doesn't quite have it going or even just, you know, when teams are inevitably going to double him and trap him, like they need guys that can uh, make use of, of the double teams that come at him and, and knock down open shots. And Clay can still do that, obviously, at a very, very, very high level. Uh, and he's just a, a really good fit. And, for Clay to go to Orlando, I think they're a great fit for him as a team where he doesn't have to go in and feel like he has to necessarily push them over the line to a championship. It's more so, okay, let's go and you know get a player who's experienced, who's got that you know who's championship proven, who can only add to what we've got in France, in France and Paolo. So I think it's a great fit for both parties. And I think from a Warriors standpoint, if the Magic are offering $40 million a season for Clay Thompson, I think you'd be kind of silly to match that uh, and, you know, give him a, what, two-year 80, two-year 75, like whatever it is. I think you'd be silly. It kind of feels like a, a Fred Van Vliet, Houston Rocket situation from last off season, where, you know, the Raptors, I don't think, had any interest necessarily in, in matching that kind of offer for Fred Van Vliet. And, you know, you're paying overs. Yes, like Clay's not worth forty million dollars anymore. Uh, but for an Orlando team, if you can't, you know, if your first priority is Paul George and you can't get him, then I think Clay on a, a short term deal at that higher number, I I think that's a reasonable deal for for them given their situation, given their need for three point shooting. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, one's value is based on what the market is willing to pay, and you know, Clay. Yes, we can sit sit here uh, for hours and say he's not worth $40 million. He's worth close to half that. But if the Magic are willing to pay it, then the Warriors are going to have a decision to make. And this is, you know, do you... Do you I think I think there's going to be some Warrior fans that may get spiteful in this situation if, if Clay really pushes the franchise and says, no, I need, like, if it's not $40 million, it's $35 plus million. And I think Warrior fans are going to get pretty annoyed with Clay if that's the situation. And that's going to... Be the frustrating element for me, you know, I throughout the entire situation, whatever happens here over the coming months, like I want Clay's legacy, you know, at the Warriors to remain intact and not be, you know, tarnished in any way. And that's probably my biggest fear throughout all of this because I can understand, you know, fans and even the franchise getting frustrated if, you know, Clay comes and says, you know, this is what I need and if I don't get this then I'm leaving rather than being more reasonable about it and saying, you know, okay, I'm worth 25 to $30 million. Can you get me something in that range rather than, you know, the 35 to $40 million that the Magic might offer? So uh, that's going to be the, the frustrating element, the biggest fear for me. Look, if Clay just comes out and says, you know what, I just need, I think I need a change of scenery. I think I need to get into a situation which is a little bit less pressure, uh, then that's, I think, fair enough. And that's understandable. And I won't you know have any ill feelings towards him for that and as i said it's going to be hard for me because i like the magic i like the direction they're going in i like paolo i like franz uh they've got a really good young team there and clay i think is a perfect fit and i think they're a perfect fit for clay so it makes a lot of sense and it's hard for me to particularly hate the situation if i'm being totally honest so uh yeah we'll just wait and see what happens there's obviously going to be plenty more to play out uh but there's clearly going to be a strong link there between Clay and the Magic right up until the free agency period starts, which is still nearly two months away. Like we've still got a lot of time here where things can ebb and flow, but I think the Magic's interest in Clay will remain unless they kind of pursue another target, which obviously Paul George is the biggest one. I'll, I'll probably talk about him in a second. Uh, I think he is obviously a better player than Clay still at this point, so I think he would be the number one priority for. The magic, uh, but he may be less realistic than what Clay is necessarily. Uh, I just wanted to get into because you know obviously this off season we're, we're starting to talk a lot about trades and who the Warriors could potentially target as they try and really bounce back from finishing tenth in the Western Conference, which was you know very disappointing. The whole elimination against the Sacramento Kings in the playing tournament was very disappointing. And so, what can they do here to try and get back into any kind of relevance really i mean this is this is not just about trying to get back to championship contention this is as much about trying to keep your head above water and try to be relevant while you've still got one of the greatest players in the game in Stephen curry like if you look at this western conference it is incredibly competitive there are so many teams above the warriors that 
you find it hard to see how they will necessarily decline at all over the next couple of seasons. And there's so many teams below the Warriors, even, I mean, there's only five in total, but a number of them are looking to bounce back uh, and, you know, push up back into the playoff picture as early as next season. And if not, if not that, then the 2025, 26 season. So this Western conference is just loaded. It is just stacked and you can see, you know, by the fact that you look at the the respective conferences, I think I th- I think the Nuggets Timberwolves series, I think they're the top, not the top two teams, but two of the top three teams with the Celtics, and the fact that's a second round matchup is pretty disappointing. <laughs> if I'm being if I'm being honest, I mean it's great to watch this. It's going to be a fantastic series. Obviously, Timberwolves took Game One. Uh, they could certainly spring or they sprung a surprise in Game One. They could certainly spring a surprise in the series. But the fact that that is a second round series rather than a conference finals is disappointing. I mean, hell, if we didn't, if it was conferenceless, having that as an NBA finals probably wouldn't be too, too uh, disappointing, I suppose. And so you've got that, and then you've got a series like Boston Cleveland, which I think is just going to be absolutely one way traffic. Uh, even you know, you look at the. The Thunder Mavericks, I think that's going to be a, a fantastic series uh, in the West as well. So the West to me is kind of just, you know, retaining dominance here. Obviously, the East probably had a couple of years there where they took the mantle back after, you know, obviously the Warriors and, and the Rockets and earlier than that, kind of the Spurs held sway in terms of the dominance uh, in, you know, the mid-2010s kind of thing. And the Western Conference was seen as the much better conference. The East kind of had their had their moments there for a couple of years, but I think it's back to the West now. And uh, it's going to be difficult for the Warriors because you look at the latter part of their season where they go 27 and 12 over the last 39 games, they have the sixth best offense, the eighth best defense across the last 39 games, which is half the bloody season. Like that is a a big sample size. And, you know, one of the things that uh, ESPN's Bobby Marks kind of looked at in his off-season guide is the fact that do you view that as fool's goal? And if you do, you know, if you do push forward and you know try and make a star trade, then that can become incredibly risky if you think you are actually closer than what you realistically are, based on the end, you know, the conclusion of the season where you go twenty seven and twelve. So that's gonna be the first thing when the Warriors, you know, Mike Dunleavy Jr. in the front office are evaluating, you know, moves over this offseason, whether it be via for agency or more so in trades because they won't be able to financially do anything significant in for agency otherwise. But do you see that like those last 39 games as, you know, fools, you know, as fools gold where we, you know, a bit better than what we probably thought we were, or does that give legitimate optimism and say, you know, we, we were really good over the second half of the season. We were one of the best teams in the league. We think we're not that far away. If we can, you know, have another season here where we don't get the Draymond incidents from the first half of the season, if we get maybe a bit more injury luck here and there, which I mean they had pretty good injury luck this season. It was more so just the the Draymond thing and the fact that the young players you had that push and pull with Steve Kerr early in the season on, you know, how much I'm gonna play Kaminga, Pods and T J D. Uh, particularly in the case of TJD, you know, it took a while for him to come into the rotation on a full-time basis and play significant 15, 20 plus minutes. So how do you, how do you view that? And I'm interested to hear your thoughts, like if in the, in the YouTube comments, or you can tweet me or whatever, like, what do you think about the Warriors second half of the season? Does that give legitimate optimism for what the franchise can do next season and how close they are to potentially contending in the Western conference? Or is it fool's goal where, you think you're close and then you potentially make some moves in the off season thinking you're close. And the reality next season is that they're still, you know, fairly, fairly far away from, you know, getting to the top of the Western conference and, you know, potentially getting back to the NBA finals. So the other, the other aspect of this is what are you, what are you willing, are, are you looking just to get back to the playoffs and be relevant again, maybe win a series? You know, how high do you want to strive here? Because, there are, there's obviously you want to win a championship. And for this franchise, like we've been used to winning championships over the last decade, that's the ultimate goal. But I think there are genuinely some teams in the NBA, there are some owners definitely in the NBA who are just happy with you know making uh, the playoffs or winning a series in the playoffs and aren't necessarily too hung up on whether they go all the way and win 
an NBA championship. And that's just the rea- reality of it. Like how hard do you push for that? When the harder you push, the riskier it might be and the further you may fall if things go badly. And so that's going to be the question for the Warriors. And the other question here with the, the, the clay piece of it is, and this is, again, I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. Do you think clay leaving pushes the Warriors into going for more and make, you know, trying to make a blockbuster trade for a big time player? Or do you think it would, you know, put them in a reality of, okay, we've just lost, you know, one one of the greatest players in franchise history. Uh, One of still our best players, albeit, you know, he was very up and down and probably overall had a disappointing year this season. Does, does that push you into resetting and just saying, okay, We've still got Steph, we've still got Draymond, but we're going to go more in the youth direction rather than trying to replace Clay with a big time star player and saying to yourself, well, you know, those Clay minutes, those 25, 30 Clay minutes, they're going to be dispersed now to Moses Moody, to Brandon Pajemski. Heck, maybe Lester Kinonias or someone like that. Like, where, what direction do you go in? Uh, that's going to be the fascinating thing. So, it's the, the two things here are whether or not the end of the season is real or false and whether or not Clay's decision, how that impacts what you're going to do in the off season in potential trades. And maybe a trade gets made before that. And if that's the case, like I would think that if, if a big trade was made, obviously we saw last off season, it was, you know, draft day a week before for agency when the Warriors traded Jordan Poole for Chris Paul. If that happened, then it would really depend on what kind of money the Warriors are bringing back on whether or not you f- feel like that's good or bad indication on what Clay's going to do. And so you don't really like, you don't really get a sense of what the Warriors are going to be trying to do here. I think before, before the Clay decision. And I do think for that reason, I do think they are going to wait, wait and see what happens with Clay before potentially making a trade maneuver. I would be surprised if they made a trade on your know, draft day again, draft night, uh, as they did last off season. I'd be very surprised if that was the case. I think they'll wait and see what Francie has in store and then reevaluate from there. Of course, things can be pushed forward if you know a star player becomes available and you think you need to make the move now and try and you know outbid uh, a number of teams or whatever else that may be trying to lure that you know that that star player then maybe the timeline has to be pushed forward and that's the case. Uh, but you just got to, you just got to run with it and see. But uh, the, uh, the athletics, Marcus Thompson had an interesting piece last week about uh, eight, poten- or in fact, it might've been the week before about eight players that could potentially be available, eight star players that may be gettable for the Warriors this off season. And this is the issue is that there's no one perfect fix for the Warriors. And I tend to, you know, evaluate things more across the entire season rather than just the conclusion of the season. Because yes, you can take the optimistic outlook that 27 and 12 over the last 39 games, this team is close. And if you just get one more major piece, then that can get you over the top and back into championship contention. I still think the Warriors are a fair way away from the top three in the Western Conference, which was you know, Denver, the, the Timberwolves and the Thunder. And you look at those teams and they've, you know, you can probably class the Mavericks in that as well, where they have got a young star player. Not well, Jokic isn't young anymore, but he's still not, you know, twenty nine years old. He's not even thirty. Murray's like twenty seven, twenty eight. They've got, you know, young star players who are not going anywhere, who are not going to decline anytime soon, failing, you know, a major injury kind of thing. So you look at that, you look at Shea on the Thunder, you look at Luca with the Mavericks. You look at Ant, obviously, with the Timberwolves, who's the youngest of them all at 22. And it's hard to see how the Warriors can potentially get close to them because there's a gap right now and those teams should only be getting better. And so you look at some of these you know, trade targets and there's not a perfect fix for the Warriors. There's not a perfect fix. Now, KD has obviously been the biggest one that's been speculated since the Suns were eliminated by the Timberwolves in the first round. I think there's of the list of the eight players that uh, Marcus Thompson mentioned in that article. I think three would make a significant impact. And I think that's KD, who is clearly still of these eight players that I'm about to mention and that Marcus Thompson mentioned. He's still the best of them. He's still the guy who lays claim to being a top 10 player in the league. 
And as such, like that's going to have a big impact on your franchise. He's also 35 years of age, you know, soon to be 36. He's entering what his 17th season next year. So really you'd be giving up a lot for one or two years of contention, maybe three at a max. And, you know, KD, I think what he's also, is he out of contract at the end of next season as well? So he can also be a free agent. So you'd want him to extend as well. You'd be committing more money to that. And so to me, like, that's that's not perfect because it's still a significant risk with the assets you'd have to get up for, you'd have to give up for a 35-year-old uh, who, you know, does have a, a, a bit of an injury history, obviously, with that torn Achilles, he's bounced back unbelievably well from that over the past few years but it's still not perfect by any means i think it makes you a bona fide playoff team and this is how i'd you know categorize these three players so you got kd i think larry marketing would make you a bona fide playoff team not just because of who he is as a player which i think is you know an all-star level forward but because of how he fits into the warrior system and because of the warriors need for more three-point shooting in the front court i just think he would fit perfectly with Draymond. I think he'd fit really well with JK as well. If you could keep JK uh, out of such a, a trade deal for marketing, which is probably unlikely based on the history of Danny Ainge. But if the Warriors could keep him out of it and, and maintain him on the roster, then I think he could roll you know, forward with a, a JK, marketing Draymond kind of front court and still have enough shooting there. Enough size, obviously, Laurie Markkinen's not known for his defense by any means, but he's seven foot tall, he can rebound. So that's that's going to be a piece that is not just about the player, but the fit. And what, you know, I think if you're looking just from a fit standpoint, I think Larry Markkinen makes so much sense. He's on $18 million contract for next season. So he's not going to, you're not going to have to give up or, or match as much salary as you would for some of these other guys. You've obviously got, uh, you know, he's going to have to, you're going to have to pay him a max deal after that, which is going to be committing long-term money, which the franchise may ne- may not necessarily be willing to go with, uh, which might put him out of range altogether. But you look at that, you look at his fit from a play style standpoint, and you look at his age as well, where he's what, 26 years old. I think he's, you know, someone that can take you forward into the, the latter part of Steph's career, obviously, which we're you know, going to come to pretty quickly. And then obviously once Steph retires as well, you could still see Markinen as a you know, 30, 31 year old still being, you know, the face of your franchise, or maybe he's you know still an all-star level player and you could trade him for other, I mean, we're talking four or five years down the line. I don't know why we're going that far, but he's, he's a perfect fit from a stylistic play standpoint and age and a contract as well. And then I think the other one is Paul George who, you know, I think I don't particularly trust him in the playoffs. And I think that was shown again in this first round series against the Mavericks. Someone asked me when it was two all uh, in that series, who who do you think is winning? And I said, I think the Mavs are winning in six because I just don't trust uh, Paul George and James Harden in a way that I do Luca and even Kyrie to an extent. Like <laughs> most of us don't trust Kyrie from an off the court standpoint, but on the court, like I trust him. And as a Warrior fan, Obviously, huge memories and unfortunate memories of what he did to us in the 2016 NBA Finals. And, you know, that guy usually comes up and performs in big games. And in game six, he didn't do it in the first half, but the second half, he was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and that's that's just the thing that I thought all along, that, you know, trust those guys more than I do PG and James Harden. And so that's going to be the thing for PG going forward. Uh, obviously he's had some big playoff games in the past, but he's also wilted to the pressure at times as well. But he's still a great player. And in terms of just getting to the playoffs, I think he would also make the Warriors a bona fide playoff team. This is you know, all assuming that Clay was to re-sign as well, I suppose. Uh, but again, you'd have to give up big assets for PG. He's a free agent, yes. You'd have to orchestrate some kind of sign and trade. Uh, can you get, I don't know, can you can you keep Kaminga out of that deal? I doubt it. Uh, Obviously, Wiggins is going to have to be in there for salary matching purposes. You're probably going to have to trade Chris Paul as well and guarantee his contract for next season. So those three guys, I think, are worth it if you're really trying to be a bona fide playoff team, at least win a series, at least be really, really relevant with Steph Curry still on your roster. I think the remaining, there's the five remaining guys in that article who don't really assure too much. 
in terms of you got Brandon Ingram, who is probably the biggest name right now because there's been reports that uh, the Pelicans are looking to go in a different direction and looking to kind of prioritize Trey Murphy the third over Ingram in that forward spot and, you know, hopefully for their sake, potentially push Ingram out and get another star next to Zion who, who fits the mold a little bit better. That will probably make Ingram available this offseason, obviously. Uh, whether a team like the Warriors, who don't necessarily have that star to give back to the Pelicans, can get involved. It might have to be a three-team trade. Maybe the Pelicans would cover it like an Andrew Wiggins for his 3 and D ability, which probably would fit more next to Zion than what you know, B.I.'s play style uh, has done, albeit we know Ingram is a far better player than Wiggins. Uh, so he's probably the most realistic player at this point that the Warriors could actually target. Again, does he make you significantly better? I have serious question marks on you know the three point shooting in the defense. If if you if you just did a a straight Wiggins for Ingram swap, even without putting the assets in that the Warriors would need to to make that trade happen, you have yes Ingram's a better player. We understand that. Yes, it fills the void of secondary scoring, uh, secondary shot shot creation. We understand that. It also would bring major question marks on the three point shooting in the front court. And it would also bring way more question marks on defense in terms of who's your you know, primary perimeter defender. So that would be a move where, yes, it's an upgrade player-wise, but it's not necessarily an upgrade on what your team will become the following season. And then you've got the likes of DeJounte Murray, who I like. And you know, I, I think if Clay leaves, then filling the, the two-guard spot with DeJounte Murray would be okay so long as maybe you tr- tried to manufacture and find more three-point shooting in the front court because Murray shot the ball pretty well from three this season, but certainly not known as a three-point shooter. Again, does fill the void a little bit more of secondary ball handling and shot creation. Uh, so I, I like it from that standpoint. Even if even if Clay was to stay, then I don't think DeJounte Murray would be the worst idea in the world. Uh, depending, obviously, on what you'd have to give up again. Can you keep Kaminga? That Kaminga's always the, the sticking point with all of these players. Can you keep him in a deal? Because I think if... I think with these bottom... For like Ingram, Murray, and then the other players that were mentioned were DeRozan, Miles Turner, and Zach Levine. If you have to give up Kaminga for any of those five players, then I'm just not doing it. I'm a, I'm a firm no on that. I'm just not pulling the trigger on any of those moves if it requires me to give up Jonathan Kaminga. Durant, Mark, and George, we can have conversations. We can have conversations on whether I'd give up Jonathan Kaminga for one of those three players. And if push came to shove, obviously, depending on what would be needed uh, elsewhere in the deal, then, yeah, I might do it. I might do it for one of those three players. But the bottom five, absolutely not. Ingram is probably the one where you might – consider it because I think Ingram Kaminga on the same team might be a bit too much overlap in play style kind of thing, lack of three point shooting guys that kind of need the ball in their hands a little bit. So maybe at a stretch I might consider, but then I'd probably want to keep Wiggins and you know, what kind of salary matching are we doing from there? So I don't know. It's very complicated, but the difficult thing for the Warriors is that this Western conference is absolutely stacked when you've got those, you know, those four teams I just mentioned, You've got, you know, you probably put, uh, you know, the Clippers, the Suns, the Lakers, the Pelicans and the Kings all as part of one group as well in terms of what they have done this season, which has, you know, ended up relatively disappointingly, I suppose, for most of those teams. But they're teams that are kind of on the edge. They could continue, you know, run it back and continue to be, you know, playoff level teams. Uh, They could tear it down and go into a bit of a decline. You know, obviously a team like the Suns, you know, we'll wait and see what happens with them, whether they're willing to give up KD or not. The Lakers with LeBron, you know, there's so many question marks over those teams, like there is with the Warriors to an extent as well. But they're all teams that if they choose to go for it again, then you'd expect to be, you know, high-level teams who shouldn't necessarily decline too much. And then below the Warriors, you've obviously got five teams, uh, three of which I think are going to be pushing for playoff action sooner rather than later, and that's the Rockets, the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies should be good next season. If they can get a full year healthy, which I know is a big if, but they just had the worst luck of any team you've ever seen this season, really, in terms of injuries. If they can get Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr. all on the court together playing 70-plus, 65, 70-plus games, it's hard to see them not making the playoffs and bouncing back to that. And then you've got the Rockets, who obviously pushed the, for the, the playing tournament this season, nearly got past the Warriors there late in the season, uh, and then obviously fell off a cliff a little bit towards the end. 
that was probably a bit of fool's gold as well. But at the same time, Jalen Green, Alperin Shengun, Jabari Smith Jr., Cam Whitmore, uh, Eamon Thompson, they're going to be, sorry, Asar, no, Eamon Thompson is at the Rockets, Asar Thompson's at the Pistons. I think I'm right on that. Uh, yeah, they've got, you know, got a bunch of young players that are going to be hoping to to get into playoff action sooner rather than later. And then the Spurs as well with Wemby. I think I was having this big conversation with a mate last week about Wemby. I think he is going to have so much more impact on winning than what we've seen in this rookie season just with the win-loss record. Like, I think the Spurs are closer to playoff action than what we necessarily realize. I think they could actually, if they made a couple of moves this offseason, they could be pushing for the playoffs next season. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. I just think Wemby's that good. I think he's going to be defensive player. I, I think he's going to be defensive player of the year next season. He might not win it this season. I think he's just been announced as rookie of the year. Uh, might come second to Rudy in defensive player of the year. But the impact that guy's going to have defensively, that he's already having defensively, uh, in addition to what he does offensively, like they are going to be a playoff team in the next couple of seasons. If it's not next season, it's going to be the year after. And I think we've all kind of got to be concerned with what's happening there uh, and how quickly they're going to be able to get back to playoff action. Because the Spurs, to be fair, have been a little bit irrelevant in recent t- in recent years before this Wemby acquisition uh, as the number one overall pick last year. So it's obviously a big offseason for the Warriors ahead. They're going to have so many questions to answer, uh, some of which are going to be easy, some of which are going to be difficult. The whole clay thing is going to you know, cause major reverberations around the franchise in terms of what decisions they choose to make after that, uh, what happens with certain players. You know, a guy like Moses Moody, who's extension eligible this offseason, does he get a you know huge jump in opportunity and role with Clay going out, or do they look to replace Clay from elsewhere outside the franchise with a trade move uh, or in free agency, whatever it is? So there's just so many question marks to be answered, uh, and I don't have the answers <laughs> to, to many of them at the moment. Uh, all I do know is that you know Clay to Orlando does make some legitimate sense, and uh, and I can see why both parties would be interested in that and. The Warriors, you know, this, the same thing can be said for the Warriors and, you know, a reunion with KD, for example, like that makes some sense as well for both parties. Uh, and we'll, we'll just wait and see what happens, but it's going to be a big off season ahead. And uh, I apologize for a bit of the break in the podcast. I uh, apologize for the potential audio issues today. Uh, I will get that sorted. And I do hope that with a brand new laptop, this is going to be a much better production Moving forward, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252, that's P-O-K-252, on Twitter slash X. And for all of you, I hope you have a great week ahead, and I'll be back in the next couple of days.